Hello everyone, I'm Molly Wood from CNET.com at South by Southwest 2012 and I am incredibly excited today to be speaking with Ray Kurzweil, engineer, futurist, author of The Singularity is Near, and then this forthcoming book, which sounds incredible, which is How to Create a Mind, mm. The Secret of Human Thought Revealed. So, no pressure for this book, that's a pretty big promise. Well, I think we actually have enough understanding now to describe the basic mechanism of the neocortex. It's this little region of the brain where we do our thinking. Right. And uh, my thesis is there's a module that recognizes a pattern and can remember a pattern. And uh, it's repeated 300 million times and it self-organizes itself into elaborate hierarchies. That's a key word. Right. That's why we can do hierarchical thinking. Uh, which is a key feature of mammals, but we took it to a greater extent. So 80% of our brain is, is the neocortex. But I describe how that works and related to things like creativity and innovation and uh, consciousness, free will, all those issues. And are you relating it to the eventual development of those same capabilities in machines? Yes, that's actually the title, How to Create a Mind. Right. Turns out a technique that we've actually gravitated to in, in artificial intelligence is mathematically equivalent to what the brain actually does. Not because we copied it, but we kind of arrived at the same conclusion, and I describe how that works. And we have very impressive examples now of artificial intelligence, like Watson, for example. Right, right. And not only does Watson understand these convoluted Jeopardy queries, but it actually sat down, so to speak, and read 200 million pages of material, including all of Wikipedia, uh, and remembered it all, and it understood it in natural language. It was not hand-coded by the scientists. So it's capable of actually absorbing knowledge from documents we've written, 200 million of them. So when you look around then, party bus pause, um, when you look around, you're sort of have most recently pegged the potential date of the singularity at 2045. When you look at something like Watson and you think about your own theory of exponential change and, and growth, um, do you feel like we might be getting closer? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's two key dates. 2029 is when a computer will actually match human intelligence. Uh, it's interesting to note that Watson, even though it actually does not understand human language as well as a human could get a higher score than the best two humans put together. Because whatever a computer can do, it can then do that over massive amounts of material and master it all and have total recall. You and I could read Wikipedia, but we wouldn't remember very much of it. It would double in size by the time we were done. Wikipedia can, can read the whole thing in, in a week right. and remember it all. Uh, so it's a very powerful combination. Uh, this should give us real confidence that that 2029 date is, if anything, conservative. And then information technology, both hardware and software, which is not appreciated, will continue to grow exponentially. So by 2045, we're talking about an increase in our collective human-machine intelligence of a factor of a billion. That's such a singular change that we borrow this metaphor from physics and call it a singularity. Right. I'm obsessed with this concept, don't you? I read your book. Um, and one of the things I find really interesting about it is that you have a fairly optimistic view of uh, what will happen post-singularity. I, I almost feel, reading your book, like that, like it's an optimism that pervades even through you know, the, the terrible news that we see today, that I feel like, well, you know, technology will fix these problems. Not everyone agrees, though. Well, first of all, this terrible news that you read is good news that you read it because 30,000 people might die in a battle in World War II, and if you saw it at all, it was in a grainy newsreel three weeks later in the movie theater. World War I, maybe you read about it in a, in a newspaper, and only elite did that. In the 19th century, there's no information at all. We have much better information today about what's wrong with the world. That's a good thing. And I have many analyses and graphs that show the same kind of progression steadily towards better health, better wealth, more education for the developing world and worldwide. All of these measures that we associate with well-being are continually improving. So this is not just off in the future. So uh, when you read, read Thomas Hobbes and Charles Dickens about how horrific human life was. Human life expectancy was 37 200 years ago. 
oh, I think I'm thrilled to be alive now, for sure. But that, that, that being said, uh, there are dangers to these new technologies. Uh, fire kept us warm, but also burned down our villages. Technology's been a double-edged sword uh, ever since we've had technology. And I've written, you know, probably more than anyone about these dangers and what to do about them, but these are not pat answers. And, and this is the major challenge of humanity. How do we control the dangers, let's say, of a bioterrorist getting a hold of biotechnology and re-engineering re a virus to be more deadly? I mean, these are negative uh, scenarios that, that we have to be wary of. So I tend to be an optimistic person. I, I think if you actually examine human history to date and look at it factually, we are steadily getting better and better off. Uh, a kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to more information than the President of the United States did 15 years ago. Uh, he or she is walking around with a billion dollars of communications and computation circa 1975. Uh, so we're all, and it's not just going to be these gadgets, we're going to be applying this exponentially growing information technologies to things like food and water and energy. Right. When you look around, though, let's say uh, at some place like South by Southwest, how much of a stake do you have in the types of, or an interest at least, the types of innovation that we're pursuing? You know, I've heard people complain that at South by Southwest, it feels like the only thing we're innovating on as a tech community is better ways to check into restaurants. Um, do you, you know, what what could distract us from from the goal of a of, of really great technological innovation? Well, I've had opportunity to talk to a very small fraction of the people here and have encountered some very creative companies that are working in artificial intelligence, biotechnology, new applications of communications and social networks, every area of technology. And in my view, we get from here to the kind of future visions I, I paint one small innovation at a time. Okay. It's not that some lab is going to make this giant leap. And so it's all of these entrepreneurs that you meet here and that I meet every day uh, that, that are going to make that happen. That was kind of my next question is do you, do you see it as one thing and it's like a Lytro comes along, a Lytro camera comes along and that pushes digital imaging forward in a, in a new direction and it all adds up to another logarithmic, logarith logarithmic graph that shows. I actually have a daily newsletter so I, I read what myself and my editorial staff come up with and we had to struggle when we began 10 years ago. Maybe once a week we'd find a real exciting story that was a breakthrough. There are now several a day. It's definitely happening faster and faster. Yeah. The printing press took 400 years to take off. The, the telephone did that in 50 years, reached a quarter of the US population. Cell phone did that in seven years. Social networks, wikis, and blogs did that in three years. Go back four years ago, most people didn't use social networks wikis and blogs. It sounds like ancient history. There wasn't so long ago. So things are happening faster and faster and it's made up of lots of innovators and the whole support around the world really because I travel the world and the American model of venture capital and angel capital and a spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship is really uh, growing everywhere uh, and that's very encouraging. So as we have access to more information, more knowledge, it seems like we also have a, the potential to generate more fear, more concern. I mean, what are the, is there a, a point at which humanity would stop itself from progressing? Do we have built-in political, religious, even scientific bar or economic barriers that could slow down this growth? You know, the things that get slowed down, if they do at all, are very small stones in the river, like take stem cell research. Right. That was, that's not, not equivalent to biotechnology. That's one little technique. And the progress has flowed around it, invented a way to create the equivalent of embryonic stem cells without embryos, by taking your skin cells, adding four genes, and creating what's called an induced pluripotent cell, which is equivalent to an embryonic stem cell. And the ethicists who are opposed to embryonic stem cells like this idea because there's no embryos involved. And it's better anyway, if you want a new liver, you'd like it to have your DNA, not the DNA of some other embryo. And more and more people are now involved because the tools of innovation have been democratized. A kid in his dorm room can start Facebook or Google. Uh, and you've got you know, teenagers like Tavi Gavinson who rules the world of fashion. She's 14 years old. 
uh, with her very influential blog. She was on the cover of Vogue recently. And so you're seeing young people uh, with very inexpensive tools who can create ideas that shake the world and actually reach the world market. Some friends and I the other day were just talking about the idea of hobbyist geneticists and hobbyist biologists who now have the tools to map viruses at home, virtually at home. And patient groups are organizing not just to keep each other informed, but to actually solve the problem. They have right. the motivation to cure their disease, and they have now the tools to do so. And if you've got 100,000 or a million people with a disease, they've got the skills. And with collaborative decision making and problem solving, software, which is solving lots of different problems, uh, that's becoming quite feasible. Um, I couldn't, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, obviously, about the future of humanity. It felt like the, the book, The Singularity is Near, is pretty positive about what will happen to humans in a post-singularity world, that we will be happily part of a, a new machine consciousness and, and a sort of biological machine existence. But I, I was very interested in the idea that there would be this small group of humans that chooses to remain natural um, and exist on a different. Well, first of all, there is chapter eight, the deeply intertwined promise versus peril right. of GNR, which talks in pretty stark terms about some of the dangers. So we are introducing new technologies that are dangerous, and that's really our major challenge. But as for people that opt out, we have them today. They're called the Amish. Maybe there are a few other groups. Uh, I mean, how many people opt out of modern communication technologies and so on? But it's not one thing. It's not like, check here. I want to be enhanced. Yes, no. I mean, there's a million choices. There's a million choices on, on uh, iPhone apps already. So there's going to be millions of choices. There'll be very conservative things which you would be foolish not to use, some nanobot that basically fights you know, many or most diseases and you'd be irresponsible not to do it. Then there'd be more edgy things that are optional and there'd be millions of those and some will be early adopted, some won't be, but it's gonna be very hard to find people that opt out completely. How many people opt out now? Well, and it seems that, that these concerns have led to kind of what could be very useful planning, right? For the kind of survival of humanity into this future singularity university and the well, the Very reason I write about these things and the reason I think it's important is for people to know where we're headed. We can't define precisely this company is going to succeed, this technical standard will be adopted, but we can talk up in general terms about what the power, capacity, price performance of these future technologies will be. And it does provide the scale to solve the major challenges of humanity. Availability of water, or applying three-dimensional printing to printing out houses at very low cost, Lego style, right. and so on. Uh, these are really feasible ideas. And people look at the problems and they get overwhelmed because they're assuming that we're only going to have 19th century tools to, to deal with them. But if they look at these emerging, exponentially growing technologies, it has the potential to solve the major challenges. At the same time, it's going to introduce new challenges. There's issues like privacy, which you're familiar with. Uh, there's more existential risks. So we have, to, we have to deal with those. Uh, I believe there is a path, but we have to give a high priority to overcoming the challenges and taking advantage of the promise. Do you ever feel like you're the, like the scientist in quantum mechanics who's studying the properties of a molecule and then changing it by looking at it? Because sometimes when I look at the predictions that are attributed to you, say 2019, we will all have heads up display glasses. I mean, are Google engineers working on those glasses because you wrote about them? I think there's some feedback. I mean, I'm actually trying to uh, influence technology in a constructive direction. The reason I write about these things is so that we will develop mm -hmm. the positive applications and also be mindful of, of the risks. So we need ethical standards, how to avoid dangers. We need rapid response systems, like a system that would respond if someone put out a new bioengineered virus. Right. That actually is in place. I've actually worked on that with the Army. Uh, so writing about those dangers is intended to get people to work on it. Right. This is maybe a little bit of a left turn, but what about space? So if, if you are imagining a civilization in which we have progressed so far that we're you know, beings of incredible consciousness that potentially start to control the universe, is it possible that some other species on a different planet gets there first, so to speak? Well, I've written extensively about that. One of, and I've, in fact, 
had a public debate at SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, yeah. about this issue. I think the common SETI assumption is that, well, this, the, the likelihood that any one planet has intelligent civilizations is small, but there's so many of them, billions of billions, that there must be thousands of them out there. Uh, the problem is that they're, they're ignoring what I call the law of accelerating returns. And once a, tech, a civilization gets to, say, the point that we were at with primitive radio and the Pony Express, it's only a matter of a few short centuries before they're dealing with the kind of technologies that I write about in The Singularity. Look how we, far we've come in even the last 150 years. Uh, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, we're going to have these fantastic technologies within a couple of centuries we'll be doing galaxy-wide engineering, it'd be impossible not to notice if there were thousands of civilizations out there doing galaxy-wide engineering, and we don't see them. Right. That's the Fermi paradox. My conclusion is they're probably not out there. You might say that must be incredibly likely that we are the first, but somebody's got to be first. Uh, in fact, it's very unlikely to have a universe altogether that can undergo evolution and encode information, right. yet here we are, by the anthropic principle, if it weren't the case, we wouldn't be talking about it. Um, so I've written about this in The Singularity is Nia. Uh, I think the fact that we haven't noticed them means we're probably not going to notice them. Or that if we're there, we're moving much faster? Well, once you get to, say, the point we are at, it's, it's a very short amount of time, cosmologically speaking, which is measured in millions or billions of years, to get to a point of vast technological reach. Okay, that makes sense. And then, what are your thoughts on the, the search for the Higgs boson? Search for? The search for the Higgs boson. And, and, I mean, I assume that you must consider it all part of our sort of every question that gets answered leads to 10 more questions and 10 more answers. That's like how a journalist understands exponential Physics growth, Physics has been great at coming up with anthropomorphic terms yeah. uh, that people can relate to because otherwise it's very hard to understand. So, I didn't call it the God Particle. So, now that came from the physics community, yeah. not from the press. Now they wish they'd never said it. Um, so, dark matter, that sounds very mysterious. So, I, I, I think it's helpful actually to, to try to make physics more understandable. And because physics leads to practical results and all of electronics is based on physics and based on quantum effects. And uh, so all of these insights lead to practical uh, insights. Uh, but understanding the world around us is a natural uh, curiosity we have. And one of the things we're curious about is how our own brains work. Uh, so that's what I'm examining in this next book. And so the book comes out in October. Yeah. Okay, I pre-ordered it today. I want you to know I'm really <laughs> looking forward to reading it. Thank you so much for sitting Our down pleasure. with us today. And enjoy Austin. I will, I am. Great. So you can see, obviously, this interview that you're watching now, many more interviews from South by Southwest, and all of our coverage at CNETV.com. Oh